Hi, my name is Austin Huang, and today I'd like to share some insights from our real-world research to production work um, from doing projects uh, in machine learning at, at Fidelity. First, I want to give an overview of how we see machine learning use cases changing in recent years. And it's, it's, there's been a shift uh, in how, what machine learning use cases look like now versus, say, two or three years ago. The second, I want to talk about this idea of model development without labeled data. So you often hear these stats like you know, 90% of machine learning projects uh, never make it to production. And, and um, I suspect one of the reasons for there's multiple reasons for that, but I suspect one of the reasons for that is that uh, oftentimes a machine learning team will hit a point where they say, oh, well, we don't have labeled data, therefore we can't move forward. And I want to kind of share some strategies to kind of expand the scope of what do you do in that context, or what are some uh, strategies there. Third, I want to talk about kind of some an end-to-end -end view of how your machine learning model gets embedded in a um, uh, in a broader application, and what are some of the things that you think about uh, even as you're kind of developing the model. So first, I want to acknowledge my team here, who are really kind of the ones that brought our machine learning projects to life and help me kind of learn some of these things as we tackle our, our projects on a day-to-day -day basis. So first, how are machine learning use cases changing? In the past, when you saw uh, discussions of machine learning systems, you always see this figure of this kind of production ML systems discussion. And it's oriented toward this idea of, a make, of machine learning as a prediction engine. So there's a focus on feature-based prediction. You have these complex data cleaning pipelines that are replicated in development and production. And you think about machine learning as these kind of big data batch inferences going through these pipelines. Recently, I think you see more and more projects that have take a different shape to them. Um, rather than just being prediction engines, they're sort of generalized perception engines. And I mean that sort of beyond you know, machine learning and robotics and other things, but really kind of perception in the sense that um, the role of a machine learning model is to shift the boundary of what you can compute on. So uh, to enable to you to compute on text through NLP, enable you to uh, process images through computer vision, and um, these sorts of use cases. So in, in these sorts of use cases, you often see um, noise becoming part of the data distribution for the, mo uh, for the model to re reflect rather than something that's upstream of them, uh, that, that's sort of cleaned up upstream of the model. You also kind of have this shift from pipelines to real-time low latency APIs. Now, these two categories aren't necessarily either or. You can always wrap an API and kind of put that into a pipeline process. But there is kind of this shift in trend of, um, of what sort of problems are being tackled that, that, that we've seen at least. And so systems that uh, have this sort of shape to them uh, look a little bit more like this, where you have a set of tools you use for model development, including data, sort of um, things to transform data and augment data. And when you've trained your model, you uh, then deploy it uh, by taking, say, like a serialized version or the final version of your model and embedding it into some sort of service API that is the uh, kind of the production interface to the model. Um, furthermore, there's some sort of consumer of that service. It could be just a client, or it could be a web or mobile app, or it could be some sort of um, embedded system uh, if you're in the realm of robotics or autonomous uh, driving. Now, um, the model can also be serialized and potentially run on the edge, right? And finally, um, there's an aspect of feedback that you want to sort of capture data that then goes back into your data sets to improve your models, right? And so um, these kind of uh, use cases tend to take on this sort of shape, including our own. So for example, um, we develop a neural retrieval uh, model that uh, basically enables in our app for young investors for people to type in some piece of text about what they're looking for. And then uh, it returns uh, some combination of content and also um, in-app uh, places that they can go to that are relevant to what they typed in. And here, so you have sort of the edge client being the mobile app. You have API services that support that, and you have a model that's basically serialized and then embedded into the API service. Another example is for um, document automation, where we use 
uh, vision and sort of multimodal models to uh, support document uh, automation, either you know categorization, recon uh, text recognition, um, and uh, uh, detection of uh, things on documents. Finally, you have internal tools to deal with text that our, our internal colleagues may use, process financial documents, process their notes, and so on. So each of these, you have kind of that model, you have kind of a deployment API, and you have kind of an integration with some sort of consumer. So I want to talk about next is how do you go about developing these models? In, in all these use cases, we um, often start without any labeled data. So how do you approach project when you're in that context? So this may be kind of, this is a, a view of maybe kind of the traditional view of how we think about supervised learning. And nowadays, often you start with some sort of pre-trained model and maybe kind of the supervised component is to fine tune that, that supervised component. But you're still relying on potentially a large number of labels, especially if you're dealing with unlabeled data, it may take quite a bit of labeling before your model behaves the way you want. Um, we often find what succeeds is to get as far as possible using programmatically generated uh, label. And that could be labels. And that could, that could be using sort of simulated data or using some sort of auto labeling strategy. And really kind of the manual labeling is just that last kind of five, 10% um, to go from the approximation that the baseline gets you um, to the details of the specific intent that you're trying to achieve with your uh, machine learning model. So one example of this is this project uh, Sim to Real Docs, which was accepted to uh, this year's New York's uh, data-centric AI workshop, where we basically programmatically control a uh, Blender renderer. Now Blender it can do is basically an open source tool that can do ray traced rendering, um, often used in say visual effects or or, or film. By pro programmatically controlling it, we can basically produce ground truth kind of like three D renders of documents under natural scene conditions. Why would we want to do that? Well, nowadays, when documents tend to come in from uh, mobile apps more so than more mobile app photos, more so than someone actually bringing a piece of paper that to a branch and then that being sort of scanned on a high quality scanner. So you need your um, all, all your models that are doing recognition, detection, classification to basically function correctly under these conditions and by using simulation, you can, we can produce ground truth and we can do domain randomization to uh, make those methods uh, robust to these uh, sources of variation. Second example is for NLP use cases, you can often take, uh, use auto-labeling strategies. And the advent of um, these kind of high-capacity zero-shot models that you can uh, design prompts to have them function uh, to do an approximation of what you're trying to achieve is a very powerful tool there. So you may start with unlabeled data and you take a zero shot model, something you can design a prompt to do what you want, say uh, approximate the uh, text class that, that you're, you're trying to achieve. Now, a lot of the zero shot li literature kind of stops there. That's kind of the end point of the model. But for a kind of a real world project, you don't actually want to deploy your zero shot model because um, it's not, 100% sort of capturing what you want the model to do. So you can insert um, human annotators at this point, and they can either sort of just correct the labels, which correcting is a lot faster than labeling from scratch, or if you're willing to sacrifice some degree of recall, they can um, just uh, correct the positive labels. And then you can take that data set that's been corrected and um, train, a, use that to say fine tune a student model. The student model is can have lower capacity because you want it to be lower latency. And um, you're also trying to deploy something that is a fit for purpose task. So you don't need all the generalizability of those teacher models. So this could be something like a BERT or a distilled BERT model that then you fine tune on this data and you deploy. So these are some examples of, how, of cases where we have projects, we start without any labeled data. And you think about part of the skill and um, success of these projects depends on your ability to think creatively about how do you generate some data to get to a baseline and then tweak that to get to your final model. So um, I talked about training. Next, I want to talk about sort of these end-to-end -end considerations of your, uh, of your model and how it's integrated with your use case objectives.
Right. And um, it used to be that if you were a model developer, kind of your primary concern was you get to, you know, high test accuracy. And after that, everything beyond that is someone else's engineer's job or the designer's job to kind of put it into production. And I want to kind of flip that a little bit, right? And um, think about as model developers, there are things you can kind of uh, consider from an end-to-end -end perspective that are, are, are worth thinking about if, if you want projects to be successful. And one inspiration here is Brett Victor, who has a lot of ideas about how to make tools uh, effective. And one quote he has here is that there can't be a delay and there can't be anything hidden. And what he means by this is that if you're creating a tool for someone to use, that any delays kind of get in the way of how a person interacts with that tool. And any sort of hidden state uh, confuses the user in terms of what's happening, how to use it. So even though he's not talking specifically about machine learning, we find uh, these, some of these ideas apply very much so, very much in uh, machine learning use cases. So, so this idea of speed comes up in terms of the inference latency of your model. And so here you see on the left is a, the experience a user would expect. And on the right, if your model inference latency is too high, you simply can't use the model at the, uh, for this use case of a user experience in a mobile app. And that just means it doesn't matter how, how accurate your model is, it, it's just not going to be uh, successful. And we've already talked about kind of one example of how you can kind of design your model of human and loop distillation where you can kind of think about that from, from the way you design your model training to um, have a low latency in mind. Another kind of direction that we've explored is with sparsity optimizations. It's not just that you have to kind of apply sparsity procedures, you actually have to have runtime support. So we had a paper earlier this year where we were seeing that if your runtime can support sparsity optimization, there's potentially a lot more headroom for even more um, speed up in inference latency than what, what we typically see with kind of uh, the current uh, procedures for machine learning compilers. And of course, uh, you should always take advantage of compiler tools like TortScript, Onyx, and TVM. Uh, often, even just sort of using them off the shelf can get you a, a 2x or more uh, improvement without that much work. So the second thing, just as sort of latency is not just purely the domain of uh, of your production engineers, um, same thing. It's worth kind of thinking about design even as you're developing your your model. Um, so let's take this example of text classifier um, for uh, for as an internal tool. You might want that text classifier to uh, feed into a user interface where maybe when a classification shows up, it shows up as a button or something uh, or as uh, something that the, the person can interact with. So you need to line up sort of your prediction head so that it's one to, it, it, it corresponds to um, those, those user interface elements, right? And um, just as Brett was saying, uh, you don't want things to be hidden. Uh, maybe you want to track kind of data as, as, uh, as it goes into your model so that it, when someone presses the button, they can see the underlying text that was classified. And, um, you may want to go beyond that, and maybe you want your model to show what passage of the text led, led to the classification. That may lead you to add, say, like a span prediction output uh, as part of your model. So here's just an example of kind of how these kind of end-to-end -end considerations of how you want the user experience to be kind of changes the way you architect your model and what you're training for. Another kind of example, kind of coming back to this uh, neural retrieval example, um, where your input is a uh, text box for someone to type in what, what they need. And you want that to drive a user experience to show different pieces of content or show kind of different deep links within the app that are relevant to their query. So here you have kind of two inputs uh, to the model where, of the content and the query itself. And then you also have the client side uh, piece of this. So uh, on the edge, it has to know how to interpret your model output and then render that into a particular view. So deep links might appear a certain way and uh, content looks a certain way. So in, in these cases, it's really just kind of reflects this, this kind of thinking about, you know, you're kind of thinking about how your model gets used beyond test accuracy and, and sort of planning for what the ultimate sort of experience or functionality of your model is, right? And one kind of first kind of order way of thinking about this is that your kind of inputs and prediction heads are interfaces between your model and uh, user interface. And I think beyond that, we need more of a, I think, a new design language for thinking about how machine learning and experiences 
uh, interact with one another. Second is how inference latency can make or break whether your uh, project is su successful. And it's kind of useful to think about that even when you're doing model development. And there's probably opportunities for compiler optimizations that go further into that sort of modeling side of things and think about sparsity and distillation as potentially like a compiler step of a model. Second, another set of um, takeaways is we talked about kind of data synthesis and auto labeling. And, and really to kind of get out of this mindset of because you don't have label data, you can't move forward. And part of the skill of developing models is to create sort of programmatic ways of generating data and using that to bootstrap your model development. And finally, we observe this kind of broader shift in, in kind of how machine learning is getting used from these kind of batch uh, big data sort of prediction engines to being these kind of perceiver capabilities that are expanding the boundaries of what, you, what sort of data that you can compute on. And so with that, I'd like to wrap up. Um, these are a few pointers uh, to some related papers and you know, feel free to get in touch with me uh, if you're interested in discussing real-world uh, machine learning in the future. Um, thanks for your time. <laughs>